I'd like to thank everybody who's at this conference, which enables us all to learn more about this complex condition and to share our experiences. While I appreciate that Dr. Feldman attended for as long as he did, when I found out that he wouldn't be hearing me speak, I made sure to point out to him personally that so-called antipsychotic medications, especially pimazide, are derived from antimicrobial agents, which contain piprazines. Therefore, if he treated someone he thought was delusional with an antipsychotic agent and they improved, it didn't prove his hypothesis that they were diluted in the first place. And in response to Dr. Nikolaus's query yesterday, you can look in any pet store for the ingredients in antiparasitic agents for dogs, and you'll find the piperazine ingredient there as well. Later today, we'll hear from another psychiatrist, Dr. Bransfield, who lectures at psychiatry residency training programs in the New York City area. He teaches psychiatrists in training that Morgellons disease exists and that numerous medications that are commonly used in psychiatry can have anti-infective properties. He and I are glad to be among an ever-growing group of psychiatrists who have people referred to us from other specialties with a diagnosis of delusions, and we can tell them that in fact they're not delusional at all and they have something treatable. He and I, uh, if you ever do meet a psychiatrist who hasn't gotten the word, please direct them to Dr. Bransfield's work, which is posted online, or to my presentation from last year or this year, with which I'll post the transcript in full on the Holman website, or watch it on the DVDs, if you think that might be helpful to somebody. This presentation is a continuation from last year's discussion of my history of symptoms, which culminated in a clinical diagnosis of Lyme disease with co-infections, including Morgellons disease. By the way, I wanted to mention that I encouraged Dr. F to come to future conferences so that he can learn more about the complex condition that is Morgellons. So we'll see, we'll see if that happens. <laughs> Today, I will briefly discuss what tests were performed to determine which specific infections were involved in my case and the treatment strategies which addressed them. I was and still am blessed to be treated by a skilled Lyme literate physician, as well as to have some support from physicians and testing that my insurance plan covers although often in a limited manner and with increasing co-pays. I plan to post a transcript of this talk on the Holman website soon as well, so I hope you won't be concerned with spelling certain treatments or pathogens if you try to take notes. The best thing to do is let this overview wash over you, and from time to time, you may recognize certain ingredients of the naturopathic treatments even as old time or folk remedies. If you are newly trying to understand the complexity of diagnosing and treating conditions associated with Morgellons disease, you might feel somewhat overwhelmed by the panoply of new terminology and treatments. I certainly did when I first started to explore how to understand my illnesses and treatment. The most important takeaway message from my presentation today is that it is very likely that you will be able to find treatments, possibly a combination of traditional Western medical treatments and complementary treatments from other medically related sources that will give you relief from your symptoms and that you will continue to feel better as time goes on. It's also very important to recognize that each person's treatment will be individualized. It will take into account not only what testing for pathogens might show, but also information about your personal medical history, your family history, genetic testing that's available, and a combination of treatments targeted at specific disease processes at different times. 
some of the treatments which helped my situation may be applicable to you and others may not. If you are beginning your journey toward feeling better, the specific information in this talk is less important than finding practitioners who empathize with you, who are experienced in treating conditions associated with Lyme disease and chronic illness, and who are willing and able to combine treatments from different areas in medicine and the healing practices. During the spring of 2008, when an attack of severe persistent arthritis was triggered after a course of treatment with Flagyl for a case of Giardia acquired on an overseas trip, I saw my family physician and told her that I thought I had Lyme disease. She ordered the standard ELISA test covered by insurance, as well as a, an ANA test, which would test for inflammation. And she also prescribed the two-week course of doxycycline recommended by the IDSA as a precaution. The ELISA test indicated that Lyme was not present by its standards, and the ANA was elevated, which prompted referral to a rheumatologist. More detailed rheumatologic testing revealed the presence of DNA associated with an autoimmune connective tissue disease. And I was started on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent, Etadolac, whose brand name is Lodine, combined with hydroxychloroquine, brand name Plaquenil. These are non-narcotic medications, which my rheumatologist explained, may take a while before you feel relief, but take them every day as prescribed and the arthritis pain should lessen. I'm not sure why it works, but it can if you really stick with it." Unquote. Not long after starting this regimen, I saw a dermatologist for the skin condition which was developing, and she thought it could be related to having Lyme disease. I told her that I had had negative testing on the ELISA and a two-week course of doxycycline with no improvement and she said she had her own experience with Lyme encephalopathy, and she had needed to take doxycycline for several months, and that I might need to do that as well, and possibly longer. She also noted that the ELISA test is notoriously inaccurate. Finding one of the good dermatologists was the turning point in my treatment. I started taking doxycycline, 100 milligram twice a day, and continued until I started my treatment with a Lyme literate physician. I also immersed myself in learning everything I could about Lyme disease. There is an excellent local Lyme support group which meets monthly and from which I got information about conferences and speakers as well as local practitioners. When I found out that there was a conference that fall of 2008 in San Francisco, which was jointly sponsored by the two main Lyme literate organizations, the LDA and ILADS, I made sure to get there. In my presentation here last year, I described meeting Cindy Casey at that conference, learning that Morgellons disease exists and that I was not alone. I also saw a presentation by my future Lyme literate doctor and was thrilled to learn that her practice was an hour drive from where I lived. The waiting list to see her was about a year, so I got on the list and kept taking the NSAID, Plaquenil, and doxycycline until we met for our first consultation. When I started seeing Dr. Corson in the fall of 2009, my insurance would cover standard lab tests from either Quest Diagnostics or LabCorp. Dr. Corson preferred LabCorp as she feels that their test reports contain more detailed information and a wider choice of useful tests. If you have an option to choose laboratory test providers within your insurance plan, you might want to discuss that with your doctor. I may digress here just to note that not every Lyme literate practitioner will have an MD or DO degree. You might be treated by a certified registered nurse practitioner, a naturopathic doctor, or a health professional who trained in another country and is well versed in Chinese medicine, for example. The point is that it will be somebody who will be guiding your treatment and developing your ongoing treatment plan with you. If you need to locate a Lyme literate practitioner near you, you can go to the LDA website 
and click on their provider list. Enter your zip code and you will get a list of names, telephone numbers, and their distance from you. Dr. Corson offers her patients the option to be treated with or without intravenous antibiotics. I wasn't sure whether IV antibiotics was something that I wanted to pursue, although I was willing to consider it. Keeping that option open, I proceeded to get a battery of tests done. Yesterday, Dr. Shaw of Hygienics Labs shared information about infections they have found, which have co-occurred with Lyme infection in Morgellons patients. I'm happy to be able to expand on co-infections that can be present, thanks to the testing at Hygienics Labs. They are really the gold standard in detection, and the detailed explanations accompanying each of the tests are invaluable. My Hygienics testing showed the presence of chronic and active immune response to Borrelia burgdorferi, the predominant Lyme disease spirochete pathogen, with the IgM Western plot strongly positive, but with some of the bands on the IgG test in the indeterminate range. I also had an elevated IgG Bartonella Hensley titer of 1 to 80, who, whose presence I expected based on what my clinical course had been. However, I was surprised to find also an elevated IgG Ehrlichia chaffiensis titer, also at 1 to 80, as well as IgG titers of 1 to 160 each for the spotted fever and typhus fever groups of rickettsii. When I discussed this with Dr. Shaw, she noted that there is sometimes cross-reactivity between the Ehrlichia and rickettsial tests. If you are a newcomer to testing, terms like IgM and IgG may be mysterious, although probably clearer now after having attended this conference. I have a quick mnemonic device to remember basically what IgM and IgG signify. I think of IgM as being like an abbreviation for immediate, meaning recent or active immune system activity against a pathogen, and the IgG as resembling the term lag or later evidence of a pathogen having been present or in the process of a longer course of infection. Dr. Shah yesterday discussed that these assumptions can be confounded by organisms that can lurk within cells or tissues and become reactivated by a stressor. A great source for understanding some of the complexities in testing for Lyme and related pathogens is Carl Brenner's excellent paper available online titled Understanding the Western Blot. It's really worth reading. Additional testing of blood samples at medical diagnostic labs in New Jersey showed positive IgG for human herpes virus 6, a pathogen to which nearly 100% of the population is exposed by the age of 3. In most people, it remains latent in blood cells, body cells, and tissues. Reactivated HHV6 can affect T cell function and can cause significant inflammation in the organs of people who are immunocompromised. I had positive IgM and IgG for mycoplasma pneumoniae, commonly known as causing walking pneumonia, which can progress to symptoms of chronic illness in an immunocompromised host. A positive IgM and IgG for Epstein-Barr virus, viral capsid antigen, and a positive IgG for Epstein-Barr virus nuclear antigen indicated the presence of active toxicity. Oh, uh, sorry, of active and chronic infection, sorry. Other tests showed a high load of heavy metal toxicity. As a sideline, I have experienced the hollow cracking teeth phenomenon, which Dr. Savely mentioned this morning. The most dramatic was when a tooth actually ejected a mercury filling. That tooth really knew what it was doing. I've had a normal bone density scan, though, within the last few years. Dr. Corson also tested for the presence of chlamydia, and medical diagnostic labs tested for IgM and IgG, but nothing was reported as detected. When I mentioned this to Dr. Nicholas, he said, the problem is, in the US, they don't measure IgA. That's a really immediate immune response and usually will show 
that there's recent reactivation of an underlying infection. And I wonder if maybe that's something that could be added to testing in the US. Maybe we'd get a better picture if that's present with this condition. It looked to me like my immune system was trying to address battles on many fronts. But Dr. Corson was undaunted. She devised a treatment plan which served to help reduce bacterial and viral loads while managing symptoms and reactions to the treatments. Excuse me, I'm gonna do a Marco Rubio here. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> um, while some traditional Western medical treatments may sound familiar, such as prescription antibiotics, you will also hear about naturopathic treatments, which themselves can have powerful antimicrobial activity. I'll start with two general concepts, which you might want to keep in mind during your own treatment. If you have been experiencing symptoms for a long time, an oral antimicrobial treatment over many months has not offered you sufficient relief, please consider at least a month or two of IV antibiotics. That may help to reduce the overall bacterial load to one that can be managed more effectively with oral and topical treatments afterwards. Taking IV longer than a couple of months may not give substantial additional benefit for most people, although it appears to have been necessary in some well-known cases. Remember also that the Lyme spirochete is a tricky invader. It sends plasmids that look like tiny lunar landing modules from its protein coat, which attempt to invade body cells by changing the compositions of their own proteins as if trying for the lucky combination to penetrate various cell walls. Due to biological adaptation, after a certain amount of treatment, the spirochete in effect recognizes the enemy medication and morphs into wearing another combination of proteins. Research has also been published which showed a case of the Lyme spirochete appropriating part of a T lymphocyte's own protein coat to try to evade detection by the immune system. When you add other chronic infections into this scenario, opportunities for increasing or decre decreasing their activity may become available. It's like a biological game of risk. One may need to use a large arsenal, I like that term, of treatments in varying combinations to counteract the crafty, changeable tendencies of the Lyme spirochetes and their posses. Ultimately, I did receive Rocephin IV for two months, or ceftriaxone. While receiving it, I took Actigal, Ursodiol, a bile acid, which helps to fight the potential side effect of developing gallstones, and no gallstone ensued. I also took courses of Tindamax, Keflex, Nystatin, Biltricide, and Plaquenil. All of these treatments were pulsed in that I would take them daily for days or weeks, then stop for a period of time. Dr. Corson made these decisions on the basis of my clinical responses. Concurrently, I was taking a range of naturopathic treatments, which worked synergistically with the Western prescriptions. Artemisinin, which is derived from wormwood bark and is antiparasitic, was intermittently added to give additional antimicrobial support. Dr. Corson gave me blank calendar pages on which to record my temperature several times per day, along with ratings of how I was feeling on a scale from one for horrible to five for wonderful at the beginning and end of each day. There's usually somewhere in between there. This helped her to determine how I was responding to treatment and direct adjustments in treatment. She also gave me a sheet which listed my medications and supplements and helped me to track what time of day to take them, whether to take them on a full or empty stomach, whether to take them with food or at a certain amount of time apart from one another. It may sound overwhelming, but posting the schedules on the refrigerator door and checking off each step makes it become a routine. Unlike some of the patients in Dr. Feldman's study, I didn't rush and fill in false data on the way to my appointment. 
My handwriting can get sloppy, though, so I did sometimes recopy my temperature, times, and readings more neatly on a new sheet with the same pen at the end of the month. <laughs> Making up data would only misdirect the treatment plan and benefit nobody. If I felt too sick to write things down or follow the plan, that's important data my doctor would need to know. Whatever method helps you to keep track, stick to it. I used detoximin chelation suppositories intermittently throughout my treatment to remove the heavy metal contamination. Because rickettsial infections can be especially damaging to the vasculature, I took a naturopathic formulation called Vein Integrity, which contains butcher's broom, horse chestnut seed extract, and grape seed extract, among others. All of the supplements that I used stated if they were vegan, as well as gluten, soy, nut, or shellfish free. Along with vein integrity, I took natto kinase, which is derived from fermented soybeans. It is a common component in the Japanese diet, and it supports healthy blood clotting and healthy viscosity, or thickness of the blood. Omega Veil Ultra is a high-quality fish oil, which also contains vitamins D, K1, and K2, again, supporting a healthy blood composition and circulation. My detoxifying oral elixir was prepared by adding the prescribed number of drops each of Renalix, Etirase, Systable, and Durcut. Remember, the spelling of these treatments will be in this talk that I'm posting on the website, so don't worry about writing them down now. A few of the elixirs Active components are Cinchona officinalis, derived from tree bark, as is artemisinin, and also used in malaria treatment. Avena sativa, which supplements needed amino acids, phosphates, and vitamins. Ignatia, which helps to reduce digestive tract inflammation. Horse chestnut, again. Golden seal, wood creosote, arnica, clematis, Berberus vulgaris root bark, Protortonia cacti, and Vinca minor, among many other ingredients. Vinca minor really sounds like it belongs in a game of risk. Sublingual Cygest, taken several times a day, also help to reduce digestive tract inflammation. Metabolic synergy capsules were added to help regulate blood sugar and carbohydrate conversion. It combines a number of essential vitamins and minerals with alpha-lipoic acid, inositol, green tea extract, and carnosine, among other ingredients. Etiris and Durcut were also applied in cream form to detoxify skin lesions. Cyfungin and Cyimmune creams help to reduce fungal load and support healing. Yesterday, someone asked if there were a naturopathic treatment used for facial scarring. Dr. Corson also prescribed Keelan ointment to help minimize already existing scars. After six weeks, artemisinin and plaquenil were phased out and glucostat was added for additional support of glucose metabolism. Oh, sorry. Um, the next few sentences would mention lots of different vitamins and supplements, and I'll post that online so you'll be able to read some of the old-timey sounding remedies include sarsaparilla, willow root, things like that. So you'll be able to read about that. I wanted to just summarize that I talk about treatment that took place over an entire year. And it was always modified according to the response I was having, really to maximize gain and minimize pain if Herxheimer reactions were going on, or other responses to the treatment. While these were the primary agents used in my treatment, they were used more often at some times than others, and were sometimes held or the amounts varied. You probably recognized that some of the components appeared in more than one preparation. Knowing when and how to change the treatment and vary the doses is where the artistry of the practitioner enters into the treatment. No matter what combinations of pathogens you might uniquely have, 
Their response to treatment may also be particular to you as an individual, and treatment will consist of finding out what works and managing the side effects or Herxheimer reactions when it does work. Every treatment plan takes time, and the regimen I have described uh, took place over an entire year, and I don't take most of those agents anymore, although there are a few that I still take which seem to keep outbreaks of the Morgellons at a minimum. The era of open source seems to be gone, but I still produce fibers after every bath or shower, um, and it's usually in places that tend to perspire or be damp during the day. It's usually not noticeable. Occasionally, I'll have a small spot start to bleed, which makes wearing white clothing a rarity. And the fact that the small spots can still occur with several in a line always reminds me of why I suspected Bartonella Hensley, which is also known as cat scratch disease, is involved. While it can be transmitted by cats, the distinctive streaky rash that you've seen pictures of can look like cat scratches as well. Yesterday, someone asked about which companies are dependable in producing good naturopathic products. Your Lyme literate practitioner will know about them. And since I mentioned many treatments by name, I'll list the manufacturers in no particular order. I have no affiliations or financial interest in any of the companies. Research Nutritionals and Makewell Nutritionals have displays across the hall, and you can see from their publications and the way their products are labeled, that they stand behind their products and can explain how and why they were developed. Some of the products mentioned in my treatment have the company in their name, like Thorns Trace Minerals. Other reliable manufacturers include Nutramedics, Pecana, Marco Pharma, Cintrion, and Moss Nutritionals, among others. Some of them have newsletters and information available online, and many also hold webinars to keep you up to date with the latest developments. There are other factors which are important to healing and maintaining gains in functioning. Due to time limitations, I haven't touched on some of the things that fortunately my colleagues have, like complementary practices such as yoga, allergy testing, dietary modifications, and exercise. Yesterday, an audience member asked about using a sauna or hot tub. Those may be part of your treatment, as recommended by your practitioner. Dr. Horowitz likens treatment in a sauna to mounting a fever against a pathogen, mimicking what the body does naturally. Dr. Wymore mentioned yesterday that some folks with autoimmune conditions might need to be cautious. It led me to recall that when I returned to my rheumatologist, after completing my year of treatment, the DNA testing came back as normal. So what indicated a connective tissue disease was gone. That affirmed to me that anyone who is diagnosed with a so-called autoimmune illness shouldn't see it as something immutable engraved in stone. Treatment can change DNA. Such change can also happen in the opposite direction. Many Lyme literate practitioners are aware of the tragic case of Vicki Logan. She was a patient who had gone undiagnosed with Lyme and a number of co-infections for many years. Judging from her response to treatment, it appeared that she might need long-term antibiotic treatment. Her Lyme literate doctor, Kenneth Leigner, referred her to the Mayo Clinic for the placement of a specialized central line port that they had available. Catastrophically, when she had testing that led them to believe that she had a severe case of lupus, she was given steroid treatment that was so strong it suppressed her immune system entirely, and she ultimately succumbed to the infections which had taken Dr. Leigner so long to keep at bay. Such disasters are why physicians should never treat solely on the basis of lab results. I was really glad to hear my colleagues state that as well. Seen in the context of her overall medical history, she would have been much better served if her port were placed as requested and the autoimmune test findings shared with Dr. Leigner, who could then decide
how to address them clinically within the context of her overall treatment. During the course of your own treatment, and I'm almost done, I promise, your Lyme practitioner will order lab tests from time to time to check for kidney and liver functions, blood cell counts, and a variety of factors which may be affected by your treatment. Testing can help to guide treatment, but it is rarely used as the sole factor to dictate one specific treatment. From time to time, I've had discussions with irate patients who state that some idiot doctor treated them for Lyme disease when what they really had was an autoimmune illness. When I ask them if they realize that the DNA markers can change with treatment and even disappear, they are flabbergasted. There is a general misconception that autoimmune illnesses are chronic and incurable. Practitioners need to explain that they can be cured and the markers help to direct the treatment. It seems that sometimes the practitioner's satisfaction at having a ready answer overshadows recognizing that patients may not realize that autoimmune conditions can resolve. The concept of autoimmune illness in general has never made much sense to me, as each organism is programmed to strive for survival. Could it be that some of the immune functions, which are causing damage to healthy cells, are trying to intercept the would-be invading plasmids of pathogens? It's like Star Wars in the human body, taking the game of risk to a whole new level. The more we learn about customizing and combining approaches for maximal benefit and minimal pain, while keeping in mind the whole picture of that unique patient's situation, the better will be the outlook for anyone diagnosed with a chronic illness.